Alrighty. So first and foremost, thank you so much for joining us for this installment of Magically Live, where today we'll be talking about VPAT's ACRs and how they can benefit your organization, all while considering the EU guidelines. For those of you who don't know, Magically Live is a series of events that we're hosting in which we'll take one accessibility topic each time and take a deep dive into it. My name is Anjali Lawani, and today I am joined by two of Magic Ed Tech's wonderful accessibility experts, Erin and Tarveen. Erin, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. I'm Erin Evans. I'm our Director of Accessibility for Consulting, and we are really excited to have you today as we dive into VPATs and ACRs, especially as they are related to the European market. Tarveen? Hi, everyone. Good morning, good evening. Myself, Tarveen, and I head accessibility practice at Magic EdTech. Thank you so much for joining the session today, and we'll be talking uh, interesting points around VPAT. All righty, just some housekeeping before we go ahead and get started. So uh, to start, we'll talk for a little bit about VPATs and ACRs, and then we'll go into a Q&A session. So as you think of your questions throughout the session, you can go ahead and drop them in the Q&A box at the bottom, and we'll address them at the end. Closed captions are enabled, so to see them, you can hit the CC button at the bottom of your screen, and languages are enabled, so you can choose whatever language is most comfortable for you. Alrighty, our agenda for today. First, we'll talk about defining VPATs and, a and ACRs, and then we'll talk about some versions of VPATs. We'll look at some sample documents. We'll unpack the details surrounding VPATs and ACRs. We'll talk about the VPAT and ACR lifecycle. And then we'll talk about some strategies for using VPATs and ACRs to your advantage. Before we go ahead and dive into this, we have a poll for everybody. All right, so the poll reads, does your product benefit from an ACR even if you are not fully accessible? And your uh, answer cho choices are yes or no. All right, and everybody said yes, you are all correct. Okay, so let's talk about VPATs and ACRs. So a VPAT stands for a Voluntary Product Accessibility Template. So, and an ACR stands for an Accessibility Conformance Report. Sometimes VPATs and ACRs are used interchangeably. The VPAT um, is a form showing compliance and an ACR provides more information uh, specific to the product. Um, an Accessibility Conformance Report is simply the filled in VPAT template with product information. Erin Tarveen, do you have anything to add to this slide? Yeah, just as you're looking at this slide, we have um, two different uh, symbols or sections where we have indicated what each of those letters are and broken them down a little bit. So as Anjali said, you know, the VPAT is the Voluntary Product Accessibility Template. Um, it is voluntary because you do get to choose to complete the form. It is about a product. It shows alignment to the accessibility guidelines. And it's a document that does already have some um, details in place. And as we go through this conversation, we'll dive a little bit more into what that looks like and how those come, what comes standard and what you fill in. The ACR is the full report that shows the alignment to those standards, shows the compliance and conformance level, and it is based on data. These two as um, elements are used interchangeably, but typically if you are working with an RFI or an RFP or a client says, hey, I want a VPAT, what they actually mean is they want that full report with all of the data, but the majority of the portion of that ACR is the content and data in the VPAT. Tarveen, is there anything else you want to add on that? No, I think it's all covered. Thank you so much, Anjali. All righty. Tarveen, can you talk to us about some versions of VPATs? Sure. So as we all know that uh, there are standard templates that are being defined by ITI website, and you can go ahead and download the required template. So we have four different templates that are there. One is VOCAC 2.1. Another one is EU301549 that is specific to European. If your product or a platform that you are rolling it out or a website uh, specific to EU, then you need to go ahead and fill the EU specific template. Then you have section 508, which is US federal 
uh, accessibility standard. And if your product is based out of US, then you need to fill up section 508 or you can offer VOCAC 2.1 as well. And then the last one is international. So if your product is like used across the globe, then that's the standard you need to follow. And all these templates have uh, different sections being laid out, which needs to be filled specific to the uh, standard you are uh, adopting. And we need to ensure that the right template is being picked, right information goes into each and every template, but end of day, they all cover VOCAC standards. So that's how these templates are being placed. And the latest version that is there right now is VPAD 2.4 that is being released in March 2022. And uh, I don't think there is uh, any recent update that's going to happen for the VPAD unless we have a major release of VOCAD 3 uh, happening. Otherwise, we are good on the current templates that we have at ITI website. Uh, Erin, do you want to add anything to this? Um, just noting that if any additional changes or the, the um, ITI updates the templates, we will make sure that we have those latest versions and we're utilizing those. Um, so if you have any questions or you're not sure, you can always reach out to us and we can um, give you some more data around that. Thank you, Erin. And the information on this slide is um, the same information that Targeting just mentioned, just going through the different key differences between the versions. And you might want to kind of think of these as, as building blocks, if you will. So the, as Targeting mentioned, the WCAG version is the basic and the WCAG standards are always listed in any of the VPAC combinations. Um, the EU version has those WCAG alignments, but also has an area where each of the places where WCAG aligns to the um, EU standards is listed within each of the su success criteria. Plus additionally, at the bottom of the WCAG templates are tables that ask questions specifically around other accessibility requirements within those standards. That same format and um, idea is used in the section 508 that there's the VPAT that has the WCAG success criteria, how it aligns to section 508, and then a section that is um, information about 508 alignment as well. The international VPAT is like the, the best part of it all, right? You get all of the information, all of those alignments to those different um, requirements and it's all put together. All right, Tarvin, can you talk to us about some basic information about ACRs? Sure, as you can uh, see on the screen, there are two different uh, screenshots that are being taken from, one is from the existing uh, like VPAT template that you can download and another one is the filled one. So if you look at uh, the left side of the screen, uh, it is the standard template that can be downloaded. On the right, we have highlighted one, two, three, four, these are the key areas that need to be filled on the VPAT template on the page one, which elaborates and talk about like, what is your product name, what you are releasing, what is the date when you performed the audit and created this conformance report, uh, who actually prepared, who is the third party auditor for your product review. And then what are the evaluation methods and scope that you have covered? So you need to ensure that everything is detailed out and it's a very much informative for anyone to understand that what are they referring to, how this product came into existence. And please ensure that mention the contact information so that in case anyone come across any of, any of the non-compliance or any challenge while accessing your product, they can directly drop you email through the contact information. Moving on to the next slide, we have detailed out, like Erin already shared, that you will come across different sections in each of the template. This is how it is being placed in the EU specific template. And you will have the criteria, for example, VOCAC criteria 1.1.1. Then you are you tested this for what kind of product? Is it web? It is non-web document based. It is open functionality software. That's how it is being detailed out and uh, 
placed in a EU template. And then what is the conformance report, conformance level? Partially support supports not applicable. And the remarks and explanation talks about like what level of compliance you have and is there any exceptions that are still there in your product? Please be assured that you notify your users well in advance that these are the existing uh, exceptions and you are working on it to ensure that the upcoming release of your product will cover all of this. That's how we place it under the legal statement that is at the bottom of the VPAT. Yeah, and thank you for that information, Tarveen. And it's really important to consider as you're as we're talking about what do these documents look like, how you, you know, what the different meanings are is kind of holistically looking at it, like why do we even consider utilizing these documents? And it is uh, an overarching view of your product the accessibility of your product at a snapshot in time. So it is based on data. And that data typically comes from an accessibility audit where all of the different success criteria are tested. And you, this report is just giving that information to your clients. I like to refer to the VPATS as a report card, right? It's just saying, this is where I am as of today. And it also gives you the information to be able to say, um, hey, we know that a user may experience a blocker at these places because on the example on the screen, for instance, the top row there is um, an example of non-text content, uh, content. So there's no alt text is basically what that particular one says. And it says it partially supports. So what it allows you to do is say, hey, we know that we have places where some of our images may not be having the correct alt text involved. And that's okay. It's good to be transparent and to tell your clients, this is where we are today. And it also shows that you are working forward to fix those problems that have been uncovered. Um, you know, it's it's a framework, it's a way to, to take the data and move it forward and be able to be transparent with your clients. All righty, should we talk about some conformance levels? Sure, so um, Tarveen touched on the different levels that are put into that second column of the, of the template. So there are five options, supports, partially supports, does not support, not applicable, or not evaluated. Not evaluated is only utilized if you're filling out the template and you are not choosing to evaluate the criteria for AAA. Most companies are aiming for WCAG 2.1 AA compliance. So most audits are done against the 2.1 standards. Of course, some people want to include the data on AAA or that is their goal. So that information is filled out. But if you're looking at the tables of the report for the 2.0 standards and 2.1 standards, you're looking at um, the top four ratings there, which is supports, which means there are no blockers. All, everything that was tested within the scope of that audit is compliant. Partially supports, as we just discussed in the previous slide, is you know some places there are blockers, some places there aren't, and we list out where those blockers are. Does not support means we don't have it in. Uh, um, a great one is 2.4.7, which is the bypass block. Or if you're thinking about it from a web perspective, sometimes it's that skip to main content link. If, if the website doesn't have that skip to main, you cannot get to the, the, a different region of your page easily, then that's gonna be a does not support. That's just one quick example. And not applicable could be, you know, let's think about videos, for instance. Not every product includes a video. So all of the standards, the WCAG standards that are related to videos and video requirements would not be applicable because that particular product just doesn't have those. So that's an instance where not applicable would be included. Right, Tarvin, you want to talk to us about the life cycle of an ACR? Sure, sure. So every time we come across the question that when is the ACR being prepared? So 
uh, ACR should ideally be prepared once you are done with your audit process, remediation, and you're planning to release the compliant product. But yes, we what we have done and what we also recommend is that whatever the current state of your product is, whatever the score you have, just ensure that you have your VPAT statements published at, at this level as well. And add a legal disclaimer, as we have already said, that you so that your people are aware of what level of compliance you are at and you are ensuring that you will deliver accessible product to them. Now, where to start? Step one, it's a multi-step process, as you can see on the screen. So step one is that you understand the product workflow with your product teams, finalize the audit strategy, try to understand is it a templatized based approach, how the product is being developed, how content is rendering, how the interactivity or simulations are being generated or delivered. Once all of this, this is gathered, that is the right stage when you have built up a test strategy. Uh, once test strategy is finalized, try to focus on what type of screen readers you want to opt as part of the audit. It will be dependent on the current usage of your product, uh, which grade and uh, which age group you are targeting. And once that is finalized, perform an accessibility audit along with experts with disabilities and involve the auditors to review our product. Try to uh, ensure that you have a detailed audit report as an outcome of step three, which includes all the possible information related to rationals and recommendations, uh, screenshots, which kind of failure, which work at guideline and all of that information. So once that is done and you are ready with the audit report, set up a meeting with your engineers uh, and the remediation team, give them a walkthrough, enable them understand that what kind of issues we have gathered and how that needs to be prioritized and how we need to build up a roadmap. That's where you play a strategic partner role or a consultant to help uh, finalize on how things needs to be done and then work in collaboration with remediation team to reevaluate, regress, review, and have a accessible product ready for next release. Then six step is finalize which template you want to deliver, the four templates that we discussed. Fill in the required information, seek, like ensure that all the information is done, ready, vested by all the stakeholders. Please ensure that the VPAT is delivered in an accessible format. So always convert it into an accessible PDF and then upload as a final deliverable in terms of compliance statement for your product. That's how we follow this entire process. Yeah, and this is, um, as Tarveen said, this is you know the end-to-end -end process of doing the audit all the way through making the fixes and then completing that um, compliance report. We asked earlier, you know, does does your product benefit from having a, a report? Yes, absolutely. And also, is it okay? When is the best time to go and complete the audit report? And the answer is is my favorite, which is it depends. It depends on what your need is, right? So if you are working with a client or maybe you're um, bidding on an RFP and you need part of that requirement is you need to have a report in hand in order to continue on in that um, selection process, it is better to have the audit done and do that information, get the report just based on those initial audit results, even if there are gaps to say, as we mentioned earlier, this is where we are today. So, you know, this is where we are today, Wednesday, September 27th, 2023. Then you can go through the other steps that Tarveen just walked through, still utilizing that same audit data and you go and you fix those gaps. And then you'll, you're able to update that report and say, hey, look, we went from partially supports to supports in five areas because we saw where our gaps were and we spent the time to make those changes. So, um, you know, when you're thinking, when is the best time for my product to have a report like this? It depends on what your particular needs are. And, you know, it's also important to think about 
making sure that you don't just do it once and walk away from it. Because as Tarveen mentioned, you know, standards will update as different um, changes are made to your product, things are going to change. So it's important to kind of think about what your cadence is to make sure that your product stays compliant as you move through. All right. Thank you so much for that, ladies. I think that we are ready for our next poll. All right. And this poll reads, who should create an ACR? Your first option is accessibility auditor. Your second option is accessibility designers. Your third option is accessibility engineers. And your fourth option is accessibility testers. So we'll give you a minute to go ahead and answer that. Yay, everybody got it right. Accessibility mm -hmm. auditors. <laughs> and let's let's just talk about that for a quick second. Um, technically, anybody can fill out the report. Um, it is best to work with uh, people who are specialists in accessibility. Um, an unbiased source is a good place in some RFPs and some, some different company requirements are that you have a third party complete the audit and the report for you. Um, but it's the most important part is making sure that you're reporting accurate data, because if you don't report the accurate data, then the report itself is not um, useful. So um, technically it can be done by anyone, but it is recommended that it is completed by people who specialize and uh, in accessibility. All right, so now we have our ACR. Fantastic, what do we do? <laughs> the, you know, it's the it's great to have it. And the most important thing is that you use it. <clears throat> so we've touched on before how it's important to share that report with your clients, right? But let's even take a step back. <clears throat> you wanna make sure that you understand what that report says and you wanna make sure your cross-functional teams understand it. One of the things with the um, conformance reports is the language should be simple for anybody who is non-technical to understand what's happening. Audit reports are very technical and the information is very um, dev heavy, which is fine, but you wanna consider the audience of the ACR, which is typically clients, people in sales and marketing will want to be able to speak knowledgeably to where your product is. So you wanna make sure that you who is that product owner or whatever can take the information from that report, share it internally, make sure they understand, your teams understand how, how your um, product is accessible what, and how to use that information. Um, and then on the other part of share it is sharing it with your clients, being transparent. Um, you will probably want to share that proactively it's better to be proactive than reactive in many situations. And accessibility is one where you can go forward and say, here's my report, here's where I'm at, I'm still working forward. Um, and then the last bullet point we have is update it. And this is again, something that we touched on, which is there is a bit of a shelf life on how valuable and how accurate your conformance report is. And the reason for that is typically speaking, you're going to be doing continuous changes to a product. If you are working with a product uh, where we can sometimes refer to those as legacy products, right? Like, you know, you're not gonna spend any more time developing anything else within that product than a report you have on that product, that's the data, it's not gonna change. But most of the time we're looking at products that are new apps or are in development and things are changing. You might change your code base. You might do a new workflow. So anytime there are some major massive changes like that, you would want to consider having an additional audit completed and possibly an update to your report. Tarveen, do you have anything you want to add to that? No, I think we are, we are pretty good. Thank you, Erin, for covering it. Certainly. All righty. And with that, we are ready for our Q&A portion. So let's see. It looks like we already have a few. All right. Our first question is, can you please shed light on what backend changes account for updates to ACR? I think we just went over this a little bit, but... Yeah. So, um, it, you know, if you're thinking about the product, like put yourself in the shoes of a client and you're saying, okay, 
what has changed since the last time I've looked at this product? Um, and if you're a product owner or somebody who's building the product, one of those backend changes could be, you know, you, like I mentioned earlier, you might have switched your tech stack and there could be some changes there. Um, typically what we see is um, an overhaul. It's maybe more of a front end change, but your UI has updated significantly. Um, and what does that look like? And when you updated your UI, did you go through the standard best practices for accessibility? And even if you did, you should still have an audit and have those updates looked at. Tarvina, is there anything you would like to add there? No, I think typically that's how uh, we follow this process. And... All right. And the next question is, does Remarks need to mention the scale at which a success criteria is partially supported? Yes, that's actually very important because that's how the information will be conveyed that what level, what level or what component is compliant, uh, why we are tagging it as partially supported and always ensure to add the exceptions to uh, give weightage to the statement that you have made to scale what level of compliance you have achieved and what are the remaining exceptions. All righty. And our next question is, should ACR be generated by only focusing on the application templating or focusing on the most accessed pages and important workflows? So that is where, if you think back to the slide where we were talking about the audit to ACR lifecycle step one, which is working with um, the team to really understand what is the scope of being tested. So every product has a different requirement, different level of pages that are you know looked at. And part of the, the strategic work on getting to, to that report is what is the scope that is being tested. If you know you have a website that focuses a lot on templatized, um, a templatized build, then in your audit, if you are testing each of those templates in the user flows that they're supposed to work, then that is reporting on those templated pieces. Sometimes you can do an entire website and those can be really big, right? So you maybe you're doing a percentage of that website. So when you're thinking about what is in what is being reported, that's why at the beginning of the conformance report, you want to be very clear what your scope is. And, you know, we tested these particular pages or we tested this user persona flow. And once you're clear on what your scope is, then your report will reflect exactly what was tested. Right. Yes, awesome. I think that's what. Uh, rightly Erin covered and it's all the more important to understand are we doing a product or a platform if you're doing a product or a platform that please ensure all the features components elements are being covered 100 percent as part of the ACR if you are focusing on the content type websites uh, assessments try to understand the templatized approach because we don't want to end up doing the work that is endless. We need to build up a strategy that is cost effective, help us reach to a level what we want to aim for and uh, what uh, will help us achieve the compliance. That's how our strategy should be. Right. Thank you so much for those responses, ladies. Those are all the questions that we have for right now. We'll give you guys a minute to think of some more while we talk about our next session. So our next session is going to be held on November 2nd, 2023, and I will go ahead and put the link for it in our chat here. And we're gonna be talking about accessible design. So you can go ahead and click that link to uh, that link to register if you'd like. If you don't have any more questions right now, that's fine. We're not going to pressure you into to coming up with questions, but you can always reach us at accessibility at magicedtech.com. If there are any questions that come up or, um, you know, if you have any inform any needs for further conversations, we're happy to help. But, you know, we would love to see you in our next session in November. 
um, accessible designs is always a fun topic to cover. So we hope you're able to join us at that time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much Thank for joining us today. Thank you. Bye, all.